youth and registrants. Uh, the CABs make up about 13% of the licensing group at this time. Um, as of August 31st, 2012, there were 3,674 applications filed. Um, 3,054 have been fully approved. That's up to over 3,100 currently. Um, there were 275 provisional licenses pending. I, I expect that to drop off in the next um, couple of months and there were 25 applications that had been denied. Uh, credit service organizations that assist a consumer in obtaining an extension of credit as a deferred presentment transaction or a title loan must hold a credit access business license. So now I'm going to kind of go through the licensing process or the application process to obtain the CAB license. So first of all, the, the application forms can all be found on our website. Um, in an effort to make this process easier and more efficient, we created these forms as a PDF so that you can type in the information. Um, we are also accepting submission through email and accepting credit card payments over the phone um, in addition to mailing hard copies in. Um, this was done to, to cut down in the time of processing and, and make the process uh, more efficient. So once the application and the required fees are received, um, the first notification that goes out is a fingerprint authorization form. And this is sent to all owners and principal parties uh, that are listed on the application form. Um, then after the fingerprint forms go out, the application is uh, reviewed for completeness. If there are any deficiencies or any additional information that's needed, a letter is sent to the applicant giving them 15 days to respond. If there is no response within that 15 days or the information that's requested was not submitted, um, then a 10-day letter is sent, which gives them 10 days to provide the requested information um, or a denial letter will be sent. So if the application is complete before the denial letter is sent and all the information that we requested was submitted, it goes to final review at that point um, for the final approval or denial of the application. If the application is approved, uh, the applicant is notified by phone by one of our licensing techs to let them know that their license has been approved and they may start conducting business. The actual hard copy license usually comes in the mail um, within about two weeks from the approval. If the application is denied for any reason, um, a denial letter is sent and it gives the applicant 30 days to request a hearing to appeal the denial if they wish. Um, if an appeal is received within that 30 days, then the application then goes to our legal department to set the hearing. Uh, if an appeal is not received, then the application is denied and a refund is given for the assessment and the endowment fees. Some of the most common um, issues that we have seen in reviewing the applications are these listed. Um, the first one is the criminal background check. Make sure that all owners and principal parties are listed on the disclosure form of the application, form of the application and that they follow the instructions that are on that form. Um, if, if they don't follow the instructions, instructions completely that are on that authorization form, um, it's been found that we, the agency does not receive the results of the background check. Um, there are also have been issues with people that live out of state or that are not in a location in which they could submit fingerprints electronically. Um, if they contact the company, the third party company that's on that form, they will give them instructions on how to do that. Typically they tell them to go ahead and submit hard cards send them into that third party company and then we get the results from it. Another issue is the owners and principal parties. Um, I guess first of all, an owner or principal party is any adult individual with ownership of over 10 percent or they have control of the proposed uh, credit access business license. Um, the biggest 
issue or problem that we see is that the information that disclosed on the ownership um, and principal parties form of the application doesn't match what's disclosed in the business documentation. So for example, if it's a corporation, um, on the application form they might list all the owners and two directors. However, when we go into the bylaws of the corporation, it might indicate that they're required to have a president and secretary elected and that there should be four directors. So then the information that's submitted in the business documents don't match what's on the form. Um, so that's something that we see quite often. If there have been amendments to the bylaws, um, make sure that you provide the minutes or the amendments to show that. Um, so I guess basically just make sure that the information that's disclosed on the form matches the business documents that were submitted. And thirdly, the net asset requirement. Um, the Texas Finance Code in Chapter 393 requires that the CAB has a net, shows and demonstrates a net asset requirement of $25,000 per location, and there is a cap of $2.5 million. The definition of net assets is found in the Texas Administrative Code, Chapter 83.3001. Um, the net asset requirement, a lot of people think that it just means they show equity at the bottom of their balance sheet, but that's not necessarily the case. The definition is very specific um, in which assets can be counted and which liabilities are subtracted from those assets to come up with a net assets. Um, generally, assets are available for use if they are readily convertible to cash within 10 days. Um, in addition to the net asset requirement, financials must be completed according to GAAP. Um, they cannot be income tax based. We see that quite often. They cannot be consolidated financials. It has to be the applicant itself. Um, the financials cannot be older than 90 days to the submission of the application. Um, unless they're audited. If they're audited financials, then they can be within a year of the date that the application is submitted. Um, and then one other thing that's not on this screen that I do want to add is that if you currently hold a license, um, be looking for renewal information that will be sent out in mid-November. We will have information posted to our website and we will also send correspondence in the mail with information on the renewals. Um, so just keep that in mind. Chelsea, we do have a question that has come in. Um, the question is, for net asset requirements, are we allowed to use CSO fees as part of the asset? Yes. Um, the CSO fees that are collected are considered, um, I guess, your asset, your receivable. Um, Something that, that we've seen a lot, um, an issue with the balance sheets, is people disclosing the, um, the receivables and the payables to the third-party lender on the balance sheet. This is not an actual asset of the CSO. It's an asset of the third-party lender, so it should not show up on the balance sheet. Okay, we're going to pause for just a moment to see if we have any other questions regarding the license fee overview, the process, application form. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more questions regarding this part. Uh, thank you very much, Chelsea, for your, uh, providing the information. Um, I'd like to induce, introduce Rudy Aguilar at this time. He is the director, director, director of Consumer okay. Protection. He oversees both the Examination and Enforcement Department and the Consumer Assistance Department. Rudy? Good afternoon. It's uh, my pleasure to be able to express uh, some information to you folks. Uh, I've been with the agency a little over 20 years uh, in the position of Director of Consumer Protection. And in that position, as was mentioned, I do supervise the activities of our field staff and examinations and investigations and the support staff here in Austin that supports their activities. Uh, we have field staff in Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio, and there's a regional supervisor in each of those communities. Additionally, I supervise the activities of our consumer assistance folks, which uh, they take 
complaints over our hotline, uh, also by written mail and by email, and they try to resolve those complaints or provide information to consumers to let them understand uh, their concerns. And so in those activities, uh, our normal uh, activities are basically involved in examination. Our exams are scheduled on a monthly basis by each of the supervisors that I mentioned. Uh, the scheduling is done on a risk basis. Uh, to begin our, our, our exam program in, in this area, we did uh, do some just regional uh, reviews of who was there and, and selected some folks to start with. Now that we have some experience with the idea of uh, previous examination experience, uh, complaints about entities, uh, issues that may have uh, resulted from the actual licensing process, we actually consider all those things as we move on uh, to schedule folks in, in, uh, in the future. So in that process, we schedule, as I said, on a monthly basis. There is not an advanced notice request requirement uh, of these uh, examinations, although the multi-license entities that exist, we may call the headquarters and actually have a discussion with them and find out how they do business, uh, how they keep their records, uh, what actually happens as far as record keeping and decision making uh, on a branch level and where it uh, runs all the way up to the headquarters. And so we'll get that information before we begin examinations in those types of licensee groups. So examiners begin their uh, examinations obviously by introducing themselves to whoever the appropriate representative is in that uh, license location. So you should have some uh, designation of a manager or a compliance individual uh, to deal with the examination. Uh, they'll get some information about that branch if we already have maybe information from a headquarters about how they do business. If it's a small business, we'll get everything there about how they do business. And uh, in that interview, we will uh, take down quite a bit of administrative information about that business and their volume levels and, and what exact transactions they're involved in. Once we do that, we will begin to select a sampling of transactions and we will look at all the documents involved with each of those transactions that we've chosen through the sampling, which will begin all the way from the initial disclosures and uh, cab agreements, uh, the um, actual loan note, uh, payment histories, and any other actions that happen on that account. So we'll go through that entire sampling. As we go through that, uh, the examiner may actually ask some further questions and begin to develop some of the issues that will come up in that examination. Uh, the reports are normally written on site uh, and actually left at the time the exam is accomplished. In a few exceptional situations, we may actually bring that uh, draft copy back to Austin and rework a final draft out of this office if we have complex issues. Uh, in that case, we'll still outbrief as we normally do uh, with the on-site supervisor and let them know what the issues are in that situation. We use a uh, rating system as an unofficial administrative tool to help us in our risk-based scheduling and in designating which exams have uh, issues that have required special instructions and therefore a follow-up of some type. And the rating system goes one through five. And one, two, and three are acceptable levels of compliance. And as you can t probably surmise, a one rating would be either no comment or, or something very simple. Two is still some pretty uh, minor issues, maybe a little bit of, of corrective action of some type. Three would actually have some substantial issues and, and some possible corrective actions, but it would still be basically in compliance. Four and five are the areas where we have serious compliance issues, and in those situations, you will have special instructions at the end of the examination and a follow-up date that could be uh, 
short as uh, a couple of weeks to as long as possibly 60 days. Rudy, can I interrupt you for a moment? Sure. We have a, a question asking how far back uh, does an entity need to hold records, specifically with transactional information, client contracts and denials, and how far back will the examiner review those records? Okay. Well, right now, we're just going back to the uh, issue date of the license. Eventually, once we get into a, an actual cycle of exams, uh, right now we're shooting for an estimated recurring cycle of 48 months uh, and that would be the time period for which you would need to hold your records. If for some reason uh, we conduct an exam over a shorter period, we may not go back that far. We just go back to whatever the exam date was as far as review of records uh, in that situation and at this time we have not developed all the regulations yet, but uh, I foresee that we will, and uh, we will actually issue some more detailed instructions. But for right now, uh, I would use 48 months uh, or shorter if you have not been in business that long since you got your license. And a follow-up to that is how often can a licensee expect to be examined? How regularly? And 48 months if you are in a an acceptable level of compliance posture and we have not received any uh, serious complaints or any other issues have come up in some way that would uh, cause us some concern. Uh, and in most situations I would imagine the majority of licensees will be in a four-year cycle. Okay, so as we talked about uh, finishing up the exam, part of the, I talked about risk-based scheduling. Uh, that rating system is used in that, and so if you're in the one to three area, uh, obviously that would be an acceptable level of compliance, and that part of the risk-based uh, considerations would go all the way to the four-year cycle. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in the speaking here. I'm 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 in another mode. Actually, 36 months is the cycle for this situation. Uh, I apologize there. I had another scenario in mind. And so right now for the exam cycle, it's planned at 36 months. And as far as record keeping, you want to go from the date you got your license uh, until you get your first exam. And then after that, it's back to your last exam. We will probably have a rule that will give you a specific time frame in the future. Okay. Uh, very quickly in the exam, as I said, we're looking at uh, predominantly the uh, requirements in the statute which are you know for you to have a license and have it exhibited for you to be uh, registered with the Secretary of State is required uh, for you to have a posting of your fees to have the appropriate disclosures uh, in writing to the consumers to have an appropriate contract and loan note and payment history is some of the things we're looking at there uh, one of the last things that I would mention is you should have some appropriate space where an examiner could complete an examination. Uh, it doesn't have to be an office. It could, it could be a, uh, a table or workspace that's sort of out of the way. So we do want to accomplish these exams uh, with the least disruption possible you know, in your uh, location. And one of the other factors that we're going to be uh, dealing with is the different types of scenarios or transactions that cabs can be involved with. And we have four designated types right now, and they're payday single payment, payday installment, title single payment, and title installment payments. The examiner will ask you which of these you conduct. And, uh, actually annotate that in the administrative information I uh, refer to that we're collecting. Our sampling will be in each of those areas and your um, disclosures uh, and fee structures uh, uh, will be obviously uh, coordinated with the different types of uh, transactions that you conduct. Okay, so in the last year we started up our exam uh, program around March uh, 
through the end of the fiscal year, which was the end of August, we conducted some 290 examinations. 90.91 uh, .91 of them were acceptable level of compliance, which means it was rated on a one through three basis, and, and that's a pretty good record. I, I would commend uh, the, the majority of the industry for, for that uh, result. Uh, there were a few places where we had some serious issues. We actually have taken some administrative actions in some cases, uh, but the findings that we uh, found that, that required some, some uh, correction were in these areas. Disclosures uh, not being provided or an incorrect disclosure being given. You need to be sure your disclosures are appropriate and, and uh, meet the requirements of the law. You have to have your fee schedules posted and it needs to be fee schedules that comply or that meet all the different types of transactions that you conduct. Uh, excessive or unauthorized uh, late fees, you have to meet the requirements uh, in the statute. Uh, as far as some of the other fees that we found problems with, if you are charging a, a fee to register a lien, you can charge what you actually have to pay for that. You cannot add any to that fee. You have to charge what the fee actually is. Uh, additionally, you have to be able to make, show us proof of maintaining your registration with the Secretary of State. So if you're not registered, uh, you are not authorized to collect uh, credit service organization fees or act as a credit service organization. So that can be an issue. Folks need to be sure they maintain that registration. Uh, it, in coordination with the credit access business license, is your authority to conduct these transactions and collect these fees. Okay. On title loans, one of the things we found is that uh, in situations where a vehicle had several owners, uh, there was not the acknowledgement of all the owners uh, as far as the registration of a lien. The classic example there was a spouse uh, getting a loan independently, but uh, the other uh, spouse having obviously that ownership interest in the vehicle and them not having that acknowledgement of the lien. Okay, so uh, that sort of quickly wraps up some of the um, issues uh, in the exam. I will go on to the idea of the quarterly reporting and these are essentially the deadlines for quarterly reporting and we're through the first two quarters and we're about to uh, be at the deadline for the third quarter. Uh, our reporting uh, completion is actually a, a, at a pretty high level uh, for the number of licensees that we have and so again I would to give the industry uh, some credit there for getting on board and getting those things in. And, uh, so you have to keep up with your reporting. One of the things that we do when you may have seen this document here that, that's up on the screen right now, and it's some of what we provide as sort of the highlights of the information off those reports. And from quarter to quarter, we will be looking at trends and comparisons and taking information from them. These reports are made available uh, on our website. And, uh, you know, many entities from legislative members to just the general public to consumer advocates to industry members all have uh, the availability of this information in uh, this very general format. Uh, we do have uh, some other formats we have provided to uh, legislative members. Uh, that's the only time that we divide anything up, and those are by major metropolitan areas. Uh, if you have questions about those, uh, you can contact us. Uh, I believe we will be making some of those available on our website also. These are a few of the comparisons off the first two quarters. As you can see, some of the sort of uh, comparisons that we'll be making and the people are making, you could look at uh, the aggregate data and, and the increase from quarter to quarter, uh, the number of consumers, the increase in the number of new loans. Uh, one of the numbers that I believe 
uh, several people will be interested in is the rate of uh, repossession compared to the number of active loans. And you can see here that it appears that that, that rate has gone down from the first quarter to the second quarter. Uh, you can also look at information by the type of transaction. In this case, we're looking at newly obtained single payment uh, refinances, uh, uh, payday loans, and the same thing for title loans. And uh, those rates are, are obviously information that uh, many people are interested in. Rudy, if I could interrupt for a moment before you go to the next section. Um, we have a question regarding the CAB reporting. Um, what, if anything, is going to be added to the reporting requirements for the annual report? And then we have a second question regarding the signatures of all those owners. Uh, would a power of attorney work instead of a spousal signature? Yes, the power of attorney will work in that situation about getting all the owners to acknowledge the lien. As far as information for the annual report, uh, the annual report is going to basically take the whole year's worth of data uh, and, and sort of wrap it up in a, in a year format. There are going to be some slightly different questions. I apologize, I don't have those right at my fingertips right now. Uh, I will get uh, Carl Hubenthal, who is our resource that deals with the report, uh, to post uh, some information here on, uh, on the information off of this webinar as to, as to what those, what those uh, topics or issues will be on the annual report. Ken and Freddie, if I could just add to that too. We are looking to schedule an annual reporting webinar. We're looking to do it towards the end of November, early December, and we will send all licensees an invitation to that as well. Okay. And so now moving on to our consumer protection activities in the sense of uh, consumer assistance. Uh, these are the complaint numbers that we've gotten uh, in the, the last part through the end of FY12 for us. That was August 31st. And we had a total uh, of 282 complaints. We closed some 280 of them. Uh, there were seven situations in those complaints where we had some $3,175 of restitution uh, that, where we returned funds to consumers. Uh, the issues, uh, the top three issues in, in uh, payday and title lending uh, are annotated here on this graph. In payday, uh, contract issues, and by contract we're talking about contracts that were either incomplete or did not contain all of the required components out of the law. And that, that's a, 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 an issue that can result in, in several different uh, situations in the most uh, dynamic. It could be that you didn't have a good enough contract to be able to establish the relationship uh, as a CSO. In that case, refunding might result as far as the CSO fee. So that's an important situation where you need to be sure you contract properly and get the acknowledgments on those contracts. Uh, the second issue in payday was excessive charges and fees. And again, if you uh, charge a fee, you need to be sure it is uh, exactly the fee that you're paying to a third party or if it's an authorized fee within uh, the statute or doesn't have a cap, uh, like the CSO fee, one of the issues there was that we found inconsistent documents. In other words, in one part of the document set there was one fee uh, disclosed or contracted for and in another part a different fee contracted for. And in many of those cases what we directed is redisclosure uh, to uh, actually uh, coordinate uh, those aspects of the documents. And the third is collection practices. Obviously, you have to comply with the uh, collection provisions of the state of Texas and uh, not take any of the activities that are uh, illegal in the sense of threats, harassment, uh, intimidation, threatening uh, criminal charges when not appropriate, uh, 
uh, it's very fact specific as to whether it, it is a, a appropriate to try to pursue hot check provisions. You need to be sure you understand that and that you truly have that fact scenario before you uh, take such an action. Uh, I don't believe you should ever be threatening anyone about that action. In title lending, again, contracts. Contracts have to be consistent in all aspects and have all the necessary components uh, that are required within the law. Same thing on charges uh, as we had before. And then in this area, the third uh, most frequent complaint had to do with uh, Folks need to be sure that a, an appropriate set of facts exist in the, in the essence of that you've got attachment, you have you know, that, that lien recorded, and then there's a default in the situation uh, before you actually repossess. Once you do repossess, you have to comply with the Business and Commerce Code in the sense of uh, an appropriate disposal of, of the vehicle or possibly acceptance of the vehicle and satisfaction of the debt. But those are both options within the law. And so those were the top three complaints in each one of those areas. I want to briefly mention, sort of going back to the idea of our examination process. We actually had some restitution out of the examinations that I referred to. It was not a large number, but I, I believe we had about $25,000 in restitution. Most of that came from uh, credit service organization fees where someone did not have the appropriate uh, filing with the Secretary of State or did not create the CSO relationship contractually as required uh, by the statute. Rudy, we do have a couple questions here for you. Um, the first one is, is a credit service organization considered a third party collector? Uh, I believe yes, in that sense. They are the agent of the lender, but they are a third party in the collection of the debt, so they do have to comply with the federal provisions. Okay, and then we also have a question as to, can you confirm whether we can utilize the hot checks division in the state of Texas? Well, let me express this. If you take a check, a post-dated check in, in the transaction, I think it would be inappropriate for you to try to file charges about that check. Okay. Or if you have an ACH that you got and for some reason it doesn't run in that situation. Uh, both of those are agreements that you have to get any transaction where it might be appropriate of you to uh, understand that there might not be the uh, funds there at the time. If somebody down the road tries to pay you with a check, if they write you at that moment, or an authorization to give you at that moment, is essentially expressing to you that it's a, a, a uh, legal form of payment right there, then, depending on all the facts, that might be appropriate at that time. But, uh, it's, it's very, very Case-specific case and fact-specific. You have, have to have, have a situation where somebody's somebody representing you have absolutely that that form of payment, the payment is valid. And then they, they do have funds. Uh, so, so if, if you're just trying to use you know, the post-dated check or your initial ACH authorization and then filing on that, I think that's questionable. And, uh, normally, we would not fit in the scenario of being able to file out on Okay. Thank you. And Sealy, um, and again, Sealy Hutchings is our general counsel. Could you speak to the recent San Antonio um, enactment uh, regarding the consecutive extensions of credit? Well, the, um, the, the San Antonio ordinance, uh, which I, I will have to admit that I, I have not studied in detail, but I did look at it uh, to see that it was dramatically similar to the Austin and Dallas ordinance. A, um, the um, Senate Committee of Business and Commerce uh, held hearing uh, Tuesday, as this week, as yesterday, that um, uh, 
uh, a number of people testified, including representatives from Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio. What the, uh, I think the fair statement to say that the municipalities are asking the, uh, the state to step in and enact a, uh, a amend Chapter 393 in a similar manner to the limitations that are contained in the municipal ordinances. Several of the senators, several, and again, several of the senators um, specifically indicated that uh, they anticipated uh, amending Chapter 393 in a way to uh, preempt ordinances, but they also seem to indicate a desire to include limitations very similar to those uh, that are contained in the ordinances. Now, obviously, session has not begun. Uh, the elections in November have not occurred. We, we still don't really know um, what the legislature is going to look like. Um, we're, we're not really certain of uh, committee assignments, especially in the House. So uh, we're not obviously certain uh, of, of what is going to happen uh, on that front. Um, as, as far as uh, starting uh, my presentation, if that's where we are, that's where we are. Okay. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to thank the Texas Organization of Financial uh, Service Centers for uh, allowing us the, the opportunity to speak directly to their members. Uh, in, in taking a look at meeting with the, uh, the management of the association, uh, the, the management explained to us uh, the difficulty that many of, uh, of the association's members uh, found okay, in being able to, to hire a, an attorney who was familiar with uh, the, the issues that are, are facing them at, in the area of compliance. So, um, really, most of my comments today are going to be directed towards the members of the association who have found it difficult to find attorneys who are competent in this area. So, uh, that's, if you will, number one. Number two, none of my comments should be taken by anybody here okay, as legal advice. I, I'm, I don't have that power uh, today, and, and that shouldn't really be something you ought to take a look at. I'd like to briefly just make a couple of comments about uh, some of the issues that have gone on before I began talking. On the power of attorney, uh, again, on the power of attorney, uh, it's certainly a, a vehicle that may be used. Uh, it, it, uh, a, a a company, though, that does allow that needs to understand that there are certain requirements there. And simply because the words power of attorney occur at the top of a document doesn't necessarily mean that it is sufficient. Um, now, um, a, a, a brief word on collection. And, and that's just that today it is much easier for consumers to record telephone conversations. Um, we have, uh, in, in my tenure here, there have been a couple of instances uh, in which a licensee um, was just absolutely certain uh, that his or her uh, employees would never have engaged in the conduct being alleged, and then lo and behold, uh, when the tape was played for them, uh, it was, uh, I'll suggest to you, more than embarrassing. Um, there's a couple of other things that very briefly I wanted to touch on. Uh, debt collection practices. Uh, in Chapter 393, specifically Section 393.626, and it's a very, very short section. Uh, I, just indulge me. A violation of, um, of Chapter 392 by a credit access business, and that's the State Fair Debt Collection Practice Chapter. With respect to an extension of credit described by 393.602, which is, again, going to be 
uh, a loan obtained by a credit access business constitutes a violation of this subchapter. So I think that the, the chapter, the, it, it specifies that a, a credit access business uh, is going to have to comply with the State Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. The other thing I wanted to, uh, again, briefly uh, mention, and that was there was a question about uh, checks. And in uh, the section in Chapter 393 that governs the contract between the credit access business and its customer, that's uh, 393-201, and specifically the section B as in boy, um, I'm sorry, C as in Charlie, uh, 3, says that this contract has to contain a statement that a person may not threaten or pursue criminal charges against a consumer related to a check or other debit authorization in the absence, and again I'm paraphrasing, forgery, fraud, theft, or other criminal conduct. So if, if a credit service organization that has obtained credit for its uh, customer with a third-party lender and taking a look at the credit service organization either acting as a servicer or as a collector for the third-party lender. If they were to threaten okay, to file with a district attorney hot check charges, they would be in specific violation of Chapter 393. There were just a couple of things there that uh, I, I just wanted to point out before uh, I begin uh, my talk. So the legal department. The legal department uh, supports the commissioner, licensing department, examination department, and consumer assistance department. And, in, and again, I'm, I'm, my talk is specifically here going to focus on 393. So, we, we spend a, a substantial amount of time reviewing contract and disclosures. In taking a, a look uh, at disclosures, the, if you will, sometimes what I'm going to refer to as the, the menu that, uh, that the CSO is required to have, uh, that's 393.222. The disclosure, the disclosure that has to be given, if you will, first before any services are performed, that 393.223. The disclosure that uh, has to be given before the contract is executed, 393.105. And the contract that's statutorily required, 393.201. Now, um, and I'm going to be talking in a little bit about some of the significance of these documents. We, we support these various departments by uh, helping to articulate uh, issues uh, with the Texas Finance Code and the Texas Business and Commerce Code. Now, how the Texas Business and Commerce Code interacts with Chapter 393, and there are, there are several ways, but the main way is in uh, article or Chapter 9 of the Texas Business and Commerce Code, and that is the chapter that deals with secured transactions. That's going to deal, that's going to be the chapter that's going to provide many of the principles engaged in how is a security interest, how does that security interest attach? How does it come into existence? Then, if there is a default, default in, uh, in this particular type of uh, transaction, it has to be uh, provided in the contract or the loan. Then, okay, with regards to repossession, what are the principles involved in repossession and in okay, moving to a public or private sale? A lot of times what that chapter refers to as a disposition. We also uh, advise the agency on new legislation and that may be from the state or the federal level and specifically changes to 393. Uh, again, if there are to be changes, it is very possible that we may be asked to, to do some of the initial drafting. The legal department uh, here also represents the agency in contested case hearings. Now, contested case hearings, 
In the in administrative law, uh, specifically in Texas, we have a uh, an act, the Administrative Procedures Act. The Administrative Procedures Act um, covers a, a fair amount of ground. Uh, it's certainly going to govern uh, the concept of open meetings. It's going to uh, uh, provide uh, also a structure for cases that that are involved in an administrative conduct context. These cases generically referred to as contested case hearings. And I'll give you a, a, a little bit more information on that as we go along. Now this next slide is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the heart and soul of Chapter 393. It's something we refer to as the triangle. The triangle in this particular case, we have a credit access business, a third party lender, and a consumer. Now if we take a look at the side of the triangle between the credit access business and the consumer, the credit access business providing the consumer with assistance in obtaining credit, the consumer paying for that or, if you will, the CSO fees. Taking a look at the credit access, the side of the triangle with the credit access business and the third party lender, you have an operating agreement between these two, and we're, we'll be talking um, um, again a little bit about that in a second, and the side of the triangle between the consumer and the third party lender. The third party lender extending credit in the form of a loan, the consumer repaying the loan and paying interest on top of that. Now, when I, uh, when I began talking, I was talking about uh, a number of the uh, the disclosures and the, the contract that, that we have assisted the agency in reviewing. A number of the problems that we have seen, okay, a number of these problems are where the credit access business does not recognize the triangle and the credit access business actually in some way, shape, or form merges with the third party lender. And I'll just give you a, a couple of, the, of brief examples. In one particular case, a credit access business uh, had all of the loans from the consumers made payable directly to the credit access business. Um, this is, if you see what I mean, that it's completely inappropriate, it's completely illegal. Um, they believed, uh, the credit access business believed that their operating loan with their lender. In other words, the loan that they got from a lender in order to make loans, they believed that that made that lender the third party lender. That's just to give you an idea of, um, of how some people did not understand that the cab and the third party lender must be structurally and financially separate. Um, and again, for, for those of you who are out there in compliance, it's important for you to understand that this particular business model has uh, actually been tested in court, and there is a, a, a case that went to uh, the Fifth Circuit, and that there is a, an appellate decision that has been rendered on this, and uh, in at least in, in my opinion, the amendment last session to Chapter 393, if, if you will, took that okay, judicial opinion and placed it in the statute. Uh, and that this independence between the credit access business and the third party lender is essential to the successful and legal operation of a credit access business. Now, when, um, when Mr. Aguilar was speaking, he, he did talk about, he did mention that there had been um, some enforcement actions. And there's a, uh, there's a couple that I do want to highlight. We have had one um, of the denials that uh, Ms. Dickey uh, referred to that did go to 
an administrative hearing, and if you will, a contested case. Now again, just briefly looking at the procedure there. An application is filed with the agency processed by the licensing department. A denial letter is sent out. The applicant has a, an amount of time to request a hearing or, if you will, generically to appeal the denial. Once they do, then they are entitled to a hearing in front of an administrative law judge where primarily okay, the proceeding is governed by the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, the Texas Rules of Evidence, except that they are gently modified by the Administrative Procedures Act. In this proceeding, the administrative law judge uh, con conducts an evidentiary hearing and the administrative law judge uh, eventually makes a decision. The form of the decision okay, is entitled a proposal for a decision. And the parties are able to, um, to file exceptions in an attempt to uh, get him to change his or modify his decision. Once his decision is final, but not the entire matter, the entire matter is then forwarded to the commissioner. In this case, for our agency, that's Leslie Pettyjohn. And it is forwarded with okay, the entire record. So all of the pleadings, any briefs, the, the transcript of the, uh, the evidentiary hearing, uh, any of the exhibits, the entire record goes to the commissioner and she reviews the entire record including, again, any briefs, proposal for decision, and then she would issue a final order. If a party um, disagrees with the final order, they are then obligated to file something that is referred to as a motion for rehearing and to point out what it is that they, what mistake that they believe was made, whether it be factual or legal. And this is a, uh, a particular document that is required in order to then be able to file an appeal of that final order with the state district court. Now, the proceeding that I just uh, discussed with the license denial uh, there is an extremely similar proceeding with an enforcement action. The difference is, is that the enforcement action begins with a notice of hearing, again, then the contested case in front of the administrative law judge. The second matter that's listed on the, the slide that's in front of you now is a license revocation. In this particular case, the licensee failed to maintain registration with the Secretary of State as an uh, CSO. The licensee operated a business under a name other than that that was applied for and provided on the CAV application. So in other words, this particular person not only did not have a registration so that they were a valid CSO, but this particular entity also engaged in all of their transactions under a name that was not on the license that was granted. Um, this licensee subsequently agreed to an administrative penalty and the revocation of the license. So because the uh, entity agreed to it, a contested case hearing was not required. Now the last area here was the issuance of preliminary reports. In, these, in the, this particular section, licensees did not timely file a second quarter data report with the agency and administrative penalties were assessed. Administrative penalty. This is a statutory phrase for a monetary fine. We're not talking about suspension of a license. We're not talking about revocation of, an, of a license. What we are talking about is an enforcement action that, if you will, a licensee will pay to the agency an amount of money Again, if either A, they agree to it, or if they proceed through the contested case action that the judge issues a proposal for decision in favor of the penalty and the amount, the uh, commissioner signs a final order, if you will, adopting the, the uh, findings in the proposal for decision, and there's no appeal. 
the um, in in taking a look uh, at this, let's let's go to the next slide. Um, I, I want to just again just to give you just over go over this just a, one more time. Okay, the agency uh, as a regulator has the authority to suspend or revoke um, a license or licenses, but the Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner must first provide notice to the licensee. There, uh, we had a, a couple of, uh, of examinations that uh, resulted in our agency uh, having a, a substantial disagreement with the licensee on the, uh, the method that, uh, that the, these particular licensees employed. And I'm specifically referring to the fact that, in our opinion, they did not recognize the triangle that I, I discussed earlier. Well, in one particular case, uh, we found that, and we only found this out later, that the licensee went on to our website uh, every day to see if we had not just simply, using the licensee's words, just taken away the license. That's, uh, uh, that would clearly be in a, a violation of due process, and that's not going to happen. So. The Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner must first provide notice to the licensee. Licensee must be allowed to request okay, an administrative hearing. And the key here is, again, must be allowed to. In the, in the case of one of the enforcement actions that I, I uh, referenced before, the licensee did not demand a hearing. In point of fact, the licensee did not want a hearing. Um, so uh, it, it's just be allowed to request. Then the commissioner makes the final decision following the notice of hearing and only after she has reviewed the entire record. And then there is certainly the ability to appeal that. Now, what is it that we, uh, what basis would the agency have to have in order to move forward with the suspension or revocation or if you will, what type of conduct that a licensee has engaged in would possibly trigger a suspension or revocation? All right. Let's take a look here. Uh, failure to pay. Failure to pay what? Well, annual assessment fees or other charges imposed by the commissioner. One of the, uh, the areas that, uh, uh, that this rather break, uh, vague bullet point refers to is that in the area of the uh, examination, if the examination has a, an extremely low mark or, if you will, there are substantial violations, the agency does have the ability to send examiners back in order to correct the violations, but charge the licensee for the examiner's time. Now, in this uh, area, this is, not a, um, this is not something that the agency takes lightly. This is not something that the agency um, just, just does. Um, it is, but it is an option that the agency has, especially if the agency receives substantial resistance to um, the correction of violations of law. Now, moving down, knowingly or without exercising due care violates Chapter 393, violates administrative rules issued under 393, knowingly or without the exercise of due care. I'd like to talk about that very briefly. In, in taking a look at this, um, in, in any type of regulation, there, there are, if you will, some things that are bright line, and there are other things that uh, are possibly a little bit grayer. In, in talking earlier, I was talking uh, about some of the work that, uh, that, that we do with, um, with the examination department and the, uh, the licensing department. In taking a look, for example, the statute is quite clear that a, um, 
a CSO credit access business must have a posting or, if you will, a menu type board of its charges. And there's certain information that has to be on there. This is a, uh, this is a requirement that is really fairly clear that it must be there. On the other hand, we have had, as an agency, both in licensing, exam, and the legal department, we have had a number of people who have called us, and if you will, in good faith, asking us, how big does the, does the lettering have to be? Um, how, how much space must be between uh, certain things? In taking a, a look, the first thing I would suggest to you is, is that the, the, the posting or, if you will, the menu board has to exist. If, if we were to walk into a place that did not have or had not made, they, where they had not made any attempt at having a menu board, this could be a, a problem. Um, if somebody has a menu board and, for example, in our opinion, possibly the uh, font that was used was too small. We would uh, we would certainly not immediately uh, move to any type of enforcement action. And I think that you can tell by uh, the enforcement actions that we have taken that uh, we certainly are not moving. Uh, that's not going to be our initial response. Now the last uh, section here: factor condition justifying denial. This is a fact exists today that had it existed at the time of original application would have justified denial of the application. So let's take a look here at a couple of things that we might, uh, uh, we might take a look at. So let's just say that today, just taking a look at something that we, um, you know, we looked at and talked about here a little bit earlier. In the contract, we talked earlier about the fact that the contract has to contain a statement that a person may not threaten or pursue criminal charges against a consumer related to a check or other debit authorization. We also took a look at the section that uh, specifically said that the um, credit access business had, had to comply with Chapter 392, the, the State Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. If, for example, we found out that routinely, habitually, a credit access business cab was actually threatening okay, its customers with okay, the pursuit of criminal charges and was violating the State Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Well, we might very well take a look okay, at that. The other thing, okay, just as an example, um, there are uh, there are if what if we found out that a credit access business was not complying with the Texas Business and Commerce Code principles on repossession? There are a number of things that could go that today that could call into question the eligibility of a credit access business cab to continue to hold that license. Now, there is a, a section in uh, Chapter 393 that's uh, a little different. So I just want to bring this up, although for, uh, for the members of the association, I'm, I'm not certain that uh, this is going to have much relevance. If five or more cab licenses have been suspended or revoked during a three-year period and these same locations were controlled or owned by the same person in this particular case, that can include a corporation that owns multiple uh, businesses or, if you will, licenses here. The commissioner may suspend or revoke licenses for all the cab locations okay, owned or controlled by that person. Uh, this was a, uh, an additional provision that was put in uh, because of the concern by some members of the legislature of, um, 
you know, us not having to necessarily prove uh, illegality uh, uh, everywhere, again, if we were able to suspend or revoke five or more cap licenses. Now, I want to talk uh, now a little bit uh, about the administrative penalty, and if you'll recall, this is what I was talking about, that this phrase, administrative penalty, uh, could also be referred to as a monetary fine. Administrative penalties may be assessed, assessed if a licensee, licensee knowingly and uh, or willfully violates or causes a violation of Chapter 393, or a licensee knowingly or willfully violates or causes a violation of an administrative rule. This is uh, very similar to uh, the, um, the standard that is contained in suspension or revocation. It's a little bit more narrow, but not a lot. And in point of fact, if you will, this is going to be a lesser uh, sanction than suspension or revocation. So the agency would be looking at something that would, again, where the violation would not be as severe. And in, uh, in taking a look, uh, we have uh, taken a look at that one um, action that was a combination of revocation and an administrative penalty. The other administrative penalties so far in Chapter 393 have been for failure to uh, timely file a quarterly report. There have been and there are uh, outstanding issues which may result in administrative penalties if the agency is not able to obtain uh, sufficient compliance by licensees. But at this point, uh, the ones that I have referred to are the only ones that uh, are final. Now, in taking a look at an administrative penalty, there are factors that are built into the statute, and you can see the section there. It's in Chapter 14. Chapter 14 of the Texas Finance Code is the chapter that uh, contains the duties and responsibilities of the Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner. The amount of the penalty will be based upon the seriousness of the violation, nature, extent, and gravity of the act, extent of actual or potential harm to a third party, in this case including a customer, history of violations, amount necessary to deter future violations, efforts to correct the violation, and any other matter that justice may require. So I'd like to, to focus on um, a couple of these. In taking a look at um, the, the context that a, an agency like ours would be looking at this. We take a look at the, this top one, seriousness of the violation, extent of uh, actual harm, uh, and efforts to correct. When we take a look at seriousness, um, that, if you will, can be very much in the, uh, in the mind of the beholder. I mean, what is serious, what might appear to be serious to one person may not appear to be serious to another person. I think that in many cases, when you're looking at seriousness of the violation, the extent of actual or potential harm is a, a factor that directly affects the, uh, the seriousness. The other part of, of this is, in many of the, the things that we're looking at, we are not looking at a single violation. And I mean this in two different contexts. One, one context could be that I'm referring to that it is that, I'm sorry, that the licensee violates one provision of law over and over and over again. The other context uh, could be that not only do they violate one provision of law over and over and over again, but there are other violations that they also repeatedly violate. These are uh, things that when 
we begin to place them in the context of these factors uh, begin to increase the amount of money that we would look at as a monetary fine. This is, uh, uh, now, in taking a look at this, let's take a look at the next to last factor, efforts to correct the violation. This particular factor is something that the agency uh, um, gives a substantial amount of credit to. License fees who take a look at taking responsibility for their actions Licensees who recognize that uh, their business model, the way that they have conducted business, has resulted in, let's say, one or more violations that possibly have occurred repeatedly. When a licensee finds him or herself in that situation, takes responsibility for this, and then does whatever is necessary in order to correct the violations, they, th th this licensee can place themselves in a far better position with us than a person who simply says, I can't do that. Um, in, in, taking a, uh, in, in taking a look at this uh, process, it, it's not this is not a process that is cookie cutter. Uh, the enforcement process, the license denial process, it is uh, generally it is an ongoing process and there is most of the time there is give and take on both sides. The one area though that the agency finds it difficult to give on is when there is a violation, a clear violation of the statute. In this case I'm referring to in your particular context, Chapter 393, or a, a specific bright line violation of the Texas and Business and Commerce Code on uh, possibly uh, the disposition of collateral. I'm really at the end of, uh, of my talk today, and we're looking now, I'm assuming, at, uh, if there are any questions. Yes, Sherry, we do have a question. We're asking, uh, or we're being asked to provide a little more commentary or a comment regarding the hot check issue, especially as it may relate to comments or opinion letters promulgated by the Office of the Attorney General. There, um, or District Attorney, I'm sorry. If, if uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I do not have off the top of my head, I believe that there is uh, one opinion letter on um, and I can't remember now specifically if it was on post-dated text or if it was on the payment uh, on a loan with the check balance. But I believe that there is at least one um, attorney general opinion on a hot check. The um, part of the comment is, excuse me, in, in taking a look at a post-dated check, a post-dated check, check is generally looked at as almost a day in the future. It is not uh, looked at as a, uh, as, as it, it will be an exchange of a good or a service for uh, money at that particular point in time. Generally, the hot check uh, provision in the penal code um, is there for the prosecution of uh, a person who obtained a, a good or a service in exchange for a check that was dated at that time. In taking a look at a post-dated check, that generally falls outside of the, uh, the penal code um, hot check provision. Okay, that's number one. Number two, in taking a look at a check that is paid to a lender for a payment on a loan. That also generally is looked at as being outside the scope of the hot check because the benefit was obtained at an earlier point in time and the, um, the consumer or the borrower on the loan really didn't obtain a good or a service by making that specific payment. So generally speaking, uh, it has been looked at that uh, that also was outside the scope of a, uh, the hot check provision in the penal code. Thank you. And we have another question for either you or Rudy, I believe. 
And the question is, is there any limitation for the lender to collect the amount agreed to in the documents? Is there, well, let me, let me take a stab and then um, I'm going to uh, imagine that Mr. Aguilar is going to want to um, complete the answer. In, in taking a look at um, the, um, the amount, um, excuse me, in taking a look at the loan agreement, uh, the loan, and again, not all loan agreements are drafted the same, uh, but it, the, a number of the ones that I have seen uh, have a contract rate at 10% and have a post-maturity rate also at 10% so that, uh, that the lender has a clear contractual right to charge the 10% um, during the post-maturity. Um, Rudy, uh, did, have you seen uh, anything to the contrary? No, I hadn't. And uh, indeed, uh, but the only thing I would add to that is that if truly the services had all been provided and you, you reach maturity in, in the transaction, uh, certainly you could pursue the debt. Uh, I think at some point, and, and you can you know, give us what you believe is the right time period, you may lose the ability to use the courts to pursue the debt. But that would be the only limitation I know of. And, and in taking a look at uh, what Rudy is now referring to is uh, generally we refer to it as the statute of limitations, and that being that uh, that the court system uh, that is set up uh, will not take uh, a debt that is beyond uh, the statute of limitations. Now, that being said, there are exceptions that are built into the statute of limitations. So this is something that um, that you should take a look at contacting specifically an attorney for. Sealy, um, I'm going to ask again, could you please repeat the answer to the lender's ability to collect? Our, our, our cab had an experience with an echoing and didn't hear the answer. Okay. Um, all right. What I was saying is, is that um, the the loan agreements that I have reviewed have, during the term of the loan, a contract rate of 10 percent per year. These loan documents also have a post maturity rate of 10 percent. This would allow a lender to charge a contract rate or, if you will, a post-maturity interest rate of 10 percent after the loan has uh, been accelerated. The, uh, as, as Mr. Aguilar pointed out, this uh, ability uh, is, is not unlimited that there in, in this state and I believe in, in all 50 states, there is a concept of the statute of limitations. And that means that a, uh, and, and again, I'm talking in a 393 context, a lender or the holder of a receivable must file okay, with the court system an action within a specified period of time or Okay, they would be barred from using the courts to pursue the debt. This, uh, um, what, what I was also saying though is, is that in the uh, statute of limitations, okay, there are provisions in the statute of limitations which can extend okay, certain um, limitations. This is something that, um, that a lender or a cab would want to seek uh, the advice of an attorney to get a more specific answer. Thank you, Celie. We do have a couple questions um, regarding uh, hot checks again. So the first question is asked, and I believe it's in the context of the post-dated check, uh, what if the check is dated for the date of the loan? The problem having, um, having it be the date of the loan uh, in our opinion, would be 
key is is that you you have a, a check that there is dated the same day as the advance. Uh, the lender would not really be uh, allowed then to charge interest because the lender would have, uh, would have uh, access to the money from that day. If the check was dated the date of the loan and the documentation said that the cab slash lender was going to hold the check, then in essence if the facts, the totality of the circumstances would be the same as a base data check. And the second question we have is if we are acting collector for the third party lender and the CSO has paid the lender their money back, then would they be considered hot checks? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, um, can you repeat that please? Sure, the question is, if we are acting collector for the third party lender and the CSO has paid the lender their money back, then would they be considered hot checks? So, if, if, I'm, if I'm understanding this, uh, and I just want to rephrase this another way. If, uh, if the CSO uh, obtains credit for a particular consumer borrower, then the loan is closed, passage of time, borrower defaults, okay? Subsequently, the lender uh, presents the, uh, the CSO cab uh, with, uh, if you will, the letter of credit, the CSO cab then acts on the letter of credit, takes assignment of the loan, is now the holder of the loan. Would the original check be considered a post-dated check? Um, I, don't, I don't understand how the facts here would change the fact that the original check, when it was given, still had a date, late, you know, at a latter point in time, it would it, the original check would still have to be post dated. Okay, thank you, Celie. Um, we have about three minutes left in our webinar, our scheduled time. And so, if you have any more questions, we do encourage you to send them in over the next minute or two, so we can address as many as we possibly can right now. Um, I do see that we have a couple more in. Um, the question is, could you please verify whether the check should be made payable to the third party lender and not the CSO or the CAB? Okay, in, um, in, um, this is, quite frankly, this is an excellent question. Um, in taking a look at a number of uh, the, um, the loan agreements, again, the loan agreement between the third party lender and the borrower, um, I'm going to I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but um, the vast majority of, of the transactions that we are reviewing have the CAB uh, CSO acting as a servicer for the uh, lender. In uh, this particular uh, situation, the, it is not just appropriate, it is almost essential that in the loan document that the lender specified to the borrower exactly um, to whom the check should be provided and how the check should be made. Uh, this is, um, this is, it's more than just appropriate. So my point is, in, in case you think I'm not answering, it is appropriate in that loan document for the lender to say or to contract that the borrower should provide the check to the CSO but made payable to the lender. It is also appropriate in that loan document for the lender to contract for the borrower to provide the check to the CSO cab and have the check made payable to the CSO cab. Okay, that is also appropriate. Now, the if the check is made payable to the CSO cab, then it is essential that, uh, the, um, that the CSO cab maintain, its, um, maintain a separate account on behalf of the lender 
okay, and to not commingle monies, uh, to not commingle the lender's money with its own. Thank you. And I have one final question for you, Sealy, before we wrap this up. Um, we're being asked, can a credit service organization sue in a civil or small claims court? And I presume that's for collection. Uh, um, the there are some um, there are some different rules regarding small claim uh, courts, and it is uh, my experience that not all judges adhere to every single uh, rule that applies to small claim courts. So. My comment back is is that it's my understanding that some small claim courts uh, might not allow the petition and others would. I don't believe that the answer is completely black and white uh, all across the state of Texas. Thank you. Um, we unfortunately have met the end of our session here. We are out of time, but I do want to uh, express our appreciation, the agency's appreciation for being invited to talk to the TOFSC's membership, answer some broad and general questions for you. Um, I want to thank Seely, Rudy, and Chelsea for their time and their willingness to come and talk to you. I would like to uh, remind you that we will post a recording of this webinar on the agency website. This recording will be posted by the end of the week, uh, 5 o'clock Friday evening. We will also compile a list of the questions asked and provide answers to those questions for you too, and we will post that on our website for your reference. Again, we thank you for your participation, and we hope that you have a good week. Thank you.